Welcome to Daniel's Timeline. My name is Dewey Bruton. The presentation you're about to see is the accumulation of over 20 years of study focused on the return of our Lord and the great tribulation that precedes his second coming. And yes, I know we've heard one wrong prediction after another. But the Lord himself said, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? In Luke 8, he said, for nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. And I believe that time is now. I believe the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God who will be at the resurrection, has revealed the true understanding of the exact course of events given to Daniel the prophet, whom the Lord himself quoted. And through this understanding, I believe things which have been hidden right out in plain sight for thousands of years are now being made known. In 2001, I began sharing this presentation with my family, a few close brethren, and even some well-known messianic leaders who seem to be quite taken back by the presentation. Even though everything is backed up by the evidence of two or three witnesses, there is a greater witness involved here, and that witness comes from you. It's the quickening within our own spirit when we hear the spoken truth. I truly believe you will experience this during this presentation. What you're about to see is an uncut and unedited presentation that was given before a live audience in January of 2005. I'm not a professional speaker, and we have a tremendous amount of information to cover, so if you hear me make a mistake or correct myself, you'll know why. You'll be seeing it firsthand just as it was presented. And now, let's turn our attention to the screen. As we get into the presentation, we'll see mysteries unfold that have been hidden right out in plain sight for thousands of years. When God reveals the truth, the prophecy pieces just fall into place all on their own. Now, before we get into the Daniel's Timeline presentation, we need to cover just a few basic things before we get started to make sure everybody is up to speed and we're all on the same page. First of all, let's look at Peter. He says, For the prophecy came not in the time uh, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved of the, by the Holy Ghost. Also in Timothy, it says, All Scripture is given for inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and for correction for instruction in righteousness. Bottom line, what that means is there's no idle words in the Scriptures of truth, none whatsoever. If God says it, he means exactly what he said. So now, before we get into the presentation, we need to what week. Uh, that's a big mystery on what this week is. Is it a year? Is it a, is it a, a set of years? What is it? And then also the day and the hour. The day and the hour that supposedly no man knoweth. We'll be covering all of these things. So let's be, begin right here with Daniel's timeline. Now, as I go through this, this, this presentation is uh, it's very focused on scriptures. And uh, we're, we're doing your, this presentation live. So if I fumble around a little bit, I will go back over it and I'll cover it for you because uh, there's an audience watching this and uh, we're not going to be cutting and editing. So bear with me here. Ezekiel 12 says, For I am the Lord, I will speak the word, and that I shall speak shall come to pass. He says, I'll speak it, and then it'll make it happen. And it shall be no more prolonged, for in your days, O rebellious house, that I will say the word, and I will perform it. And I will say it, and I'll make it happen, saith the Lord God. Now, the reason he does that is, is revealed in Amos 3 7. It says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. God will speak it to his prophets first, and then he'll make it happen. God will not make a move until he reveals it to his, his prophets, and his prophets speak it on mankind, and then God moves on it. But he will do nothing until he reveals it to his prophets. Now, here we are. Daniel's timeline. Can we discern the year tribulation starts? Do we have enough scripture information to find it? Has enough prophecy been fulfilled? Does God even intend for us to know before it happens? And remember, there are no idle words in the scriptures. If God says it, he means exactly what he says. So we're going to believe God for a change and what he really says about all this instead of maybe what we've been told he said. We're going to read it for ourselves. Now, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge brings forth understanding. According to God, his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 
That's the unspeakable name of God right there, the yod Hey vav Hey name. They try to pronounce this as Jehovah and Yahweh and Yahweh. 8 and 17, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Yeshua said that, or Jesus, his Christian nickname. That's pretty plain. Here's other scriptures that uh, also say and give evidence that we are supposed to know. Yeshua is also talking here in John 16. He said, The Spirit of truth has come. Uh, how bit when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth, and He will show you things to come. In Revelation it says, And He said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show unto His servants the things which must shortly be done. Now that Revelation is written to those on whom the ends of the earth are going to fall. And that's our generation. That's written to us. In Daniel 9, we're, we're getting into the Daniel part now, and we're going to follow this along verse for verse. But at the beginning of Daniel 9, 23, it says, At the beginning of thy supplication the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So, Daniel has been told to understand. So let's see what we can understand. And we're going right into the Daniel presentation right now. We're going into the Daniel verses that actually displays exactly what God's going to do. Daniel 9.24. The angel told Daniel, it said, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Well, that's pretty plain. He says from some starting point here, Daniel, there's going to be a 70-week period, and we're coming to where there will be a no sin, everlasting righteousness, and the most holy has been anointed. That can only mean one thing. God's rest starts. That's all it can mean. Now, this original Hebrew text, this word week, was translated from the word Shabuah. Seventy Shabuahs are determined. This is what this is the whole mystery here. They've been trying to put this weeks down into something, trying to figure out how it fits and everything. But if we just go back to the original Hebrew word that was used for week, it was Shabuah. What is a Shabuah? Shabuah, it says, is a period of seven, seven days or seven years, a week. Also, it is says it is a feast of weeks, one Shavuot or Shavuot or one Pentecost. Now, here is the exact scripture in Hebrew. Shabuim, Shabim. I'm not a knowledgeable on how to speak the Hebrew language, but I can read that part where it says it's uh, it's the plural of the word Shabuah. It's Shabuim means sevens it means more than one feast of weeks it means feasts of weeks what this scripture actually says is that 70 feasts of weeks or 70 shavuot this verse can also be read as 70 shavuot are determined shavuot shavuot is one of the lord's feasts called the feast of weeks and also known as pentecost in the christian churches so 70 shavuot are determined, or 70 feasts of weeks are determined on thy people. Shavuot. There's only one feast of Shavuot per year. The starting point can also read 70 Shavuot or 70 years are determined unto God's rest from some starting point. We need to find out what the starting point is. So let's display our starting point, 70 years, and God's rest. Now let's go to the next verse. Daniel 9.25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Okay, we see this starting point now is a commandment to restore. That is a commandment to restore. And from this commandment to restore, according to what the angel told Daniel, 
It says, from this commandment to restore unto the Messiah will be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks, or 69 years. From this starting point to the Lord's return unto the Messiah shall be 69 years. This is exactly what the scriptures are saying. We're going to look at this as the days immediately following tribulation. This appears to be, at first glance, it appears to be a year in between here. But this is not necessarily so. The Lord said, uh, immediately following the years of tribulation of those days, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. So we don't know exactly how how long of a period this is. Say, for instance, in December, say December of 2004, I ask you what year it is. You'd say, obviously, 2004. 30 days later, when January the 1st came, I'd ask you what year it is again. You'd say 2005. So it depends on where in the year you are as to where, how far apart this gap is. But right now, we're going to call it the days immediately following tribulation. Let's go to the next verse. Daniel 9, 26, it says, And after, after three score and two weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of thereof shall be with a flood. And to the end of war, desolations are determined. So after three score and two weeks, from this starting point, from this commandment to restore, there is a 62-year period, a 62 year period that's going to transpire. And then after that three score and two weeks, it says here the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed in this period here. If you'll notice that 69 years to here and 62 years to here, that leaves seven-year period right here. Seven-year period. That's, that's Daniel's prophetic week. This is the prophetic week that people have been looking for uh, uh, just to make sure that everyone can understand what we're talking about when we say three score and two weeks uh, one score is 20 years so if you have 20 if you have three scores it would be three twenties so that's 60 years plus or and two more years so we have 62 that's the same way on these others work the same way it says three score seven and two. Three score is one. Uh, one score is twenty. So this is uh, three score is sixty, and then seven weeks is is sixty seven, and two more weeks it says was sixty nine. Uh, but anyway, this is how you count those. A score is twenty. So three score and two weeks is the same as to say sixty two weeks or sixty two years, as we understand that the the Hebrew uh, translation of the word weeks is. And this is the seven-year prophetic week that uh, everyone has been looking for. It's right here. Now, let's continue on. We have this 62 years have transpired, and we have, we have a seven-year period right here. And let's continue on as we see that the sanctuary in, in within this seven-year period, the sanctuary is destroyed, flood and wars are determined and the desolations are determined that's exactly what's going on in the seven year period according to the daniel 9 26 verse let's go on to the next verse daniel 9 27 and says and he shall confirm the covenant with the many for one week there's the one week it says in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation, and that determined be poured out on the desolate. Okay, now he's talking about in the midst of the week right here, right here. There's a three and a half year period. If it's in the midst, there's three and a half years on this side, and there's three and a half years on that side. And according to the scripture that was given Daniel, or the, according to the instruction that was given Daniel by the angel, it says when this this part here happens, there will be a, the altar will be shut down. There will be an abomination set up. This things will happen. The altar will be shut down. The abomination, uh, Jerusalem will be made desolate. Uh, there will be fleeing, and there will be floods, and there will be wars all going on here at this marker, this this time right here. This is Daniel's chart. We have plotted those whole thing, that whole Daniel's chart right here. This is called, we're going to be referring to this off and on throughout this whole presentation. This is called Daniel's, this is called the prophetic baseline. Prophetic baseline. Okay, great. We've got all this plotted, but now what year are we in? 
Uh, this is 2005. If you go all the way back from Adam, counting it back there, we're at 6,005. According to the Jewish uh, year count, we're at the year 5765 from creation, and they know they're 240 years off. We can call it uh, 119J5S.3. It doesn't matter what we call it. We can call it whatever we want. We can call it the year of the we can call it the year of the computer. Who knows? What we need to know is where we are in God's time. It doesn't matter what you call it if you know where you are. A good example of this is we've all taken trips down the freeway and the interstate, and we see these little mile markers that show up once a mile, every mile. And if you see one that says 120 on there, you know that you're 120 miles from your next from the destination or the state line or, or whatever. Well, God has his own mile markers too, but they're not in distance. They're in time. They're called jubilee years. Now let's learn what a jubilee year is. In Leviticus 25, he gives Moses gives us the definition, or God gives Moses the definition of a jubilee year. It says, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and ye proclaim, proclaim liberty throughout the land, and all the inhabitants thereof, and it shall be a jubilee to you. And ye shall return every man to his possession, and ye shall return every man to his family. In the jubilee year, that fiftieth year, uh, ye shall neither sow, neither sh- Reap that which groweth of itself, nor gather the grapes uh, in of thy vine undressed. And you'll blow that shofar to sound the jubilee year. It says, on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement. So God is saying that his jubilee year starts in the fall feast at the day of atonement. So this is this is this is how a jubilee year works. There is, they they work in sabbatical year sets. The first sabbatical year set is seven years. There's there's six years. This is almost like creation. There's six years and then a seventh year sabbatical. There's a total of seven years. The next sabbatical is a total of fourteen years. The next sabbatical six years and the seventh year sabbatical. There's twenty one years. Twenty eight, thirty five, forty two. In 49, when you do seven sets of seven, seven sets of seven years comes to the end of 49 years. And on the Day of Atonement, the 50th year is proclaimed jubilee throughout the, all of Israel. Now, when, this, when you come to this 50th jubilee year, then you start back all the way at the top over here and go through another set of sabbaticals again. This, 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 this continues over and over and over. Now, so this is what we know so far. A jubilee year happens every fifth, every fiftieth year. The debts are forgiven and counted as paid. The possessions are restored to the original owner. Uh, at the year of jubilee, a trumpet is sound throughout all the land. And it happens at the fall day of atonement or Yom Kippur, and then the rejoicing and the celebrating starts. Now. We know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, man has a jubilee year every 50th year. I wonder, does God have his own jubilee year of restitution? According to the scriptures, he does. In Acts 3.20, it says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, and whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitutions of all things. In other words, God's got his own jubilee year too, too. And he calls it until the times of the restitution of all things. These are restoring man back to his possessions or his possessions back to man. This is restoring God's, the his earth and the fullness thereof back to God. And this was spoken of by God by the mouth of the hall of the holy prophets since the world began. This is nothing new. God has his own jubilee year. Which one is it, though? Which one of them is his? And that, if we go back to Genesis 6, we'll, we'll discover this. And said, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. His days shall be in 120 years. Now, mankind is on the scene here. This is not from creation. This is from Adam. He says, My, says, my spirit will not strive with man. Man's on the scene. This is from Adam. She'll be 120 years. Now, they've tried to peg this on Noah forever. 
in Genesis 5 2, we're going to disclaim that this is 120 years. They say no, it took 100, it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. According to the scripture, the word of truth, the word of God says Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Then in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Okay, now we have three sons here. All three sons are born. And Noah's 500 years old. Okay, in the 600th year, the fountains of the deep were broken up. So 500 years old, and all the sons are there. That's only 100 years. And by chronology, you can count all the way back from Shem Shem was 102 years old when he entered the ark right here. Shem was 102 years old when Noah was 600. And you can count back, obviously, the five, the 100 years and see that Shem was about two years old when Noah began to begin the ark. Here he is born. Here he is recorded that he's there. He was two years old. So this is only 100 years. It is not 120 years. That's And they try to peg this on Noah, and it is not. Now, let's look at this as being 120 jubilee years. And the Lord said, My, stri my spirit shall not strive with man forever. He is also yet flesh. His days shall be 120 jubilee years. One jubilee is 50 years. If you have 120 of these jubilee years, that is a total of 6,000 years. And remember, and God rested on the seventh 1,000-year set. From Adam, along about 4,000 B.C. to the present, we're up. We're at the threshold of this 6,000 years when God is going to call in his 120th jubilee year, the time of restitution is of all things. So how do we find a jubilee year? Like we did the manna week, we, go, we follow the instruction book, the scriptures of truth. Back in Isaiah, we read, remember the former things of old. It said, I am God, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times of things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do my pleasure. There is that speak and that do all over again. I will declare it to my prophets. My prophets will speak it and I'll perform it. I'll make it happen. So if he declared the end from the beginning, what is that? By far the most well-known example of the ancient times showing the things that are to come is when God declared the end from the beginning, the creation week versus the latter years. The creation week as six days, the latter years as one day is as a thousand years, as the latter years as six thousand years. Now here, here is a good, here's a perfect example for this so we can illustrate it. Here's creation week. Day one through six, God created the heavens and earth, and they were all they're in, and on the seventh day he rested. Now in the latter years, he said a day, he also told us the day is as a thousand years. So 4,000 B.C., right there at Adam, starts here. It clicks down to 3,000. 3,000 starts here. clicks down to 2,000. 2,000 starts here. Down to 1,000, beginning here, all the way down to zero. And the Lord was born here around 3 or 4 B.C. And there, time stops going backwards. It starts going forward, A.D. This is B.C.E., and this is A.D., or I, I still like to call it B.C. and A.D. The uh, evolutionists have changed all this, you know. But anyway, this is about 0 B.C. BC right here, and time's going forward. From here to there, 1,000 A.D. is right there. 2000 A.D. is right here. Now, then Adam is here at 4000 B.C. Along about uh, 2000 B.C., Abraham was born, the first patriarch. Our father Abraham was born. From, and then about 2000 years later, Yeshua was born. And then about approximately 2000 years later after that is where we are today. Now, from, a a from Adam unto Abraham, 2000 years is the same that is 40 jubilees. From Abraham to Yeshua is 2,000 years, or 40 jubilees. From Yeshua to the present day, to God's rest, to where we are right now, approximately where we are right now, 
is 2,000 years, which is another 40 jubilees. There's our 120 jubilee years all over again right here, right here. Now, what we're looking for is a jubilee. So what do we have that looks like this in our world history within the last 100 years? What do we have that looks looks just like creation week? It looks just like the creation the latter years. It's the Six-Day War, the 1967 Six-Day War. In six days, there was, there was war, and Jerusalem was reunited on the seventh day. Now, this looks identical to the Creation Week and the latter years and the Six-Day War. They all look just alike, but we need more witnesses. We can't just use the assumption that we have a, a blueprint likeness laid here it, it is it's just like a true uh, transparent blueprint likeness we can't use that we need more witnesses so we need to start counting some of these years and, and to see how they fit and how they fall we're going to start out saying assuming that the six-day war in 1967 is the blueprint likeness of the creation of the latter years we're going to call that jubilee year number one and see what happens here so if we'll take 1967 and just deduct 50 years off of that, see what the next one comes up to be, see if it's anything important or a dynamic year of any type that might appear to be a jubilee. So 1967 minus 50 years brings us to 1917. This is the year the 400-year Islamic rule ended. This is, uh, this is uh, the the Balfour Declaration, this is the year that General Allenby came in there. As a matter of fact, I think they even had patches, uh, wing patches on their uniforms as they flew over Jerusalem. A sim very symbolic thing. This is definitely looks like a Jubilee year. We're going to call this Jubilee year number two. Now let's take 1917 and take another 50 years off. 1917 minus another 50 years brings us to 1867. This is the final uh, emancipation of the Jews in Austria and Hungary. That definitely looks as though a jubilee year. Now, uh, these dates were not just dreamed up. They were actually taken off a website uh, uh, from the Division of Israel Foreign Ministry. Anybody can go to this website and get all these. Now, let's go a little further here. 1867, if we go ahead and click off 50 years all the way back, it'll take us exactly to 333 B.C. 333 B.C. just happens to be the year that Alexander the Great, who was called the second beast, described as a he-goat with one horn, conquered the Medes and the Persians, the first beast, which was described as the ram with uh, two uneven horns. It brings us back to this right here. Now, we've been going backwards all this time, but we need to see what's in front of us. So let's see what the next jubilee year would be. We'll go to our earliest known jubilee, our latest known jubilee years, 1967. We're going to add 50 years to that. It brings us to 2017. So it's in the future. How are we going to, how can we find out? Um, is it or isn't it? We'll use just a little bit of logic. We'll use some of. We'll use. We'll go back to Daniel's seventieth week, and we'll use a little bit of logic to determine this, to, for God to give us the answer, like He did with the man a week here, or the man a week date. Okay, two thousand seventeen. Now this is a given here. We're obviously in or near the new millennium, which means we're near six thousand years from Adam to the present. That's a given. We all know that. Uh, we've discovered that 120 jubilees equals 6,000 years, which means that the next jubilee is most likely the 120th one, which is the Lord's jubilee since we're around 6,000 years. So, And that's the time of restitution of all things. So let's go back to Daniel's prophecy now and apply what we know. Daniel said, from the going forth of the commandment to restore, 70 years are given to make an end of sin and to anoint the most holy. So from that commandment to the millennium rest is 70 years. And we're saying that this millennium rest possibly is a jubilee year of 2017. Well, how do we determine that? 
did some commandment go forth seven years before, on, before 2017, all the way back down to here? If it did, this would validate 2017 both as the next Jubilee year and it would validate it as the 120th one too, the Lord's Jubilee, since we're 6,000 years. So this commandment that went forth, it should be a major thing right over here. Why? Because that would be the event that starts this countdown, Daniel's countdown of years to the Lord's return. That's going to be a major thing right here. It's not going to be something done under a bushel. It'll be a major thing. So 2017 minus 2017 minus 70 years all the way back to here equals what? 1947 is exactly what it computes to be. On November the 29th, 1947, moved to action by the horrors of the Holocaust, the U.N. devoted to divide Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. Jerusalem, it said, would belong to the world right here. The fig tree nation has become a state again, has become a country again. This is the fig tree nation, Israel. That's well known. Now, Matthew, here's what the Lord said about it. Matthew 24 said, Now learn the parable of the fig tree, Israel. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation, ours, will not pass 70 years till all these things be fulfilled. Now here, here are the dates again. 1967 is our, is our one known jubilee year. Plus 50 years brings us to 2017. Daniel's, uh, the 1947 fig tree nation plus Daniel's 70 years also brings us to 2017. And I don't consider that a coincidence. So here we have our Daniel's chart. We're going back to our Daniel's chart, and we're just simply going to lay in the years. November, 19, uh, November 29th, 1947 is the starting point when the commandment went forth. Now, we're not talking about when God made it happen. God made it happen in 1948. The Scripture says specifically from the going forth of the commandment. The commandment went forth here in 1947. Israel became a nation again in 48. But the commandment went forth here. So 1947 plus 70 years equals, comes to 2017 or God's rest. The rest begins. The next line was uh, from the going forth of the commandment unto the Messiah. It will be three score, seven and two years. That's 69 years. So from 1947 plus 69 brings us to 2016 to the end of tribulation. The Lord's return. The next line or the, the prophetic baseline, it says after 62 years, so 1947 plus after 62 years, the 62 years onto that brings us to 2009. The after 62 years in between here, the prophetic week comes to 2010 to 2016. So we have a three and a half year period on this side, a three and a half year period on this side, and in the midst of the week, in between there is 2013. According to the Daniel's timeline thing that the is the angel gave Daniel, the year will be 2013 is the midst of the week when the altar is shut down and the abomination is done. So now let's look at our confirming witnesses. Daniel's 70 Shavuot or years prophecy timeline has been given. The visual blueprint of the creation in the latter years has been given. He's given us a 1967 uh, six-day war as a the Jubilee year. He's also given us the ancient times showing the things are yet to come. We've had 200 years of Jubilees counting backward and forward, all the way, actually all the way to 333 B.C. And we've uh, got the parable of the fig tree nation where Israel became a nation again, and that happened in 1947. That's when the commandment went forth. And we also have the confirmation of the 120th Jubilee year. I mean, we have more than two or three witnesses. We've got a multitude of witnesses here. We only needed two or three, but let's look at one more thing where God sh shows that he will give us the future just by simply looking at the ancient times. 
This is going to be a little comparison here. In 1947, the command went forth, and Israel became a free nation again. From 1947 to 2017, when the God's rest start, is 70 years. The temple was restored, destroyed in 70 A.D. From 70 A.D., it was destroyed by the Romans. In 70 A.D. to this point is 1,947 years. Adam was conceived in 1,947 B.C. From his, from his conception until the temple being destroyed was, was 2,017 years. From Adam until the Exodus, when Israel went forth, the free nation was 50 jubilees. It was a jubilee of jubilees. And then as this was 70 years when they went forth a free nation in 1947, that's 70 years here, when Israel went forth a free nation out of Egypt, from there to there is 70 jubilee years. The similarity is absolutely profound. So can we discern the year tribulation starts? Do we have enough scripture information? Has enough prophecy been fulfilled to find it? You bet. Yes, it has. The seven-year prophetic week begins in 2010, in the midst of the week, 2013. And 2016 is the year that the Lord returns. This is all according to Daniel's timeline. 2013 is in the midst. That's the prophetic week. Now, Daniel's timeline, we've determined that 2013 is the midst of the week uh, when the uh, abomination and the altar is shut down. The next thing that comes up is the midst of the week. Now, we've seen what the midst of the week, it was the fall, it was the last seven years of that 70 weeks or that 70 years. Now, so when in 2013 does the tribulation start? What season will it be? How can we know? The counting of years, we're counting years, but now we're going to be counting exact uh, actual days, according to Daniel, counting exact actual days. Now, but if this two third, this 2013, and the midst of the week must be consistent with each other. They these this have to match with this, and this has to match with that. If it doesn't match, then 2013 cannot be the right year. It cannot be. It's got to complement each other. It's got to fit. It's got to match. It's like when God reveals his truth, all the prophecy pieces just fall in place all by themselves. All we got to do is just stay out of the way and watch him work. So now we're going to get into the midst of the week right now. This is our Daniel's chart. This is our prophetic baseline. We're going to be focusing on this seven-year period, this prophetic week. Our focal point is actually going to be on this last three and a half years, the last three and a half years, this is when the altar shut down, the abomination is done. This is our focal point. This is the key that's given for the day counts. Now we're going to we're going to spread out this little this little chart right here and start plotting the days, just like we did the years. We're going to start plotting days. Here's our marker for the midst of the week. Here's our marker for the uh, return of the Lord. 2013 to 2016 and there here's our black marker right here uh, for the blessed day this is the this is the day that God's rest start and we're counting by days now we're, we're strictly counting by days in Daniel 11 it says that the arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. We have two things going on here. We have a daily sacrifice stopped, and we have an abomination placed. We only had one marker, so we're putting additional marker there for the second action that happens. We have one action, the sacrifice. We have a second action that some kind of abomination is done that makes Jerusalem desolate. This is where the t this is the, this is a picture of the Western Wall here and the Temple Mount. This is where the Temple Mount used to stand, right over here. And if you can see in the background, this, I hope you can see this, but in the background over here, that is the Mount of Olives. That's how close it is over there. It's not like it's a long way away. Things are close. Things are close. When the Lord comes back, uh, most likely these grove of trees will be probably taken out. But anyway, then this is the Western Wall. Now let's continue on with our, with our information here, our counting of days. 
In Daniel 9, 27, we read this one earlier. It says that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Okay, we have the altar shut down. And it says an abomination shall make Jerusalem desolate. Those flee, those that be in the mountain in the in Judea flee into the mountains. Anyway, it's made desolate right here. Not at the altar, but it's at the abomination. Daniel twelve it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty fifth day. So this is all pertaining to this altar marker right here. First of all, we have two day counts. First of all, we have a 1,335 day. It says it's a blessed day to last all the way to there. We know that's the wedding date. That's our given date. That is a blessed day. And then we have the two hundred, uh, the 1,290th day from the altar to the end of tribulation right here. That's how that plots. This is our given date. We know that the blessed day is the wedding day, and we know when we know according to the Jewish calendars what day that the Feast of Tabernacles or uh, Sukkot or the wedding day falls. We, that's our given date. Just like the manna week, when we had 215 was our given date, this is our given date here. We know when this happens. From 1,335 days to 1,290 days, we see that this little gap right here that we didn't know whether it was a year or what, we see that it's 45 days. Just subtracting the two shows that that's a 45-day period right there. Now, let's go to the next verses. Matthew, this is the Lord's words, Matthew 24. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, the Lord is going back and quoting Daniel, referring to Daniel, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, some kind of image on this temple mount, some kind of abomination sets up. Uh, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. So the fleeing is going to be right here. It says when the abomination is done, the fleeing starts. Not here. Things are applying to this marker here, the abomination. Yeshua also says, but pray that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation, which was not since the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be. He said, pray that your flight not be in the winter, and neither on the Sabbath, right here. He says, and that our winter is over. Every March the 21st is when winter is over. That's when he says the great tribulation starts right there, at the fleeing, right at the flight. So this must be the this is the end of tribulation right over here. Now, in Revelation twelve it says the woman fled into the wilderness. Here's the fleeing part. Here's the fleeing. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. We have another set of days here. Three score, one score, a score is twenty. So a thousand two hundred and three score days. A thousand two hundred and sixty days. So from the fleeing part, according to uh, John in Revelation, from the fleeing part, there's a 1,260-day period right there to there where the woman is fed for 1,203 score days till the end of tribulation. Now, it's it's pretty easy to look here now to see how, how much of a gap this is. If from, if from there to there is 1,290 days, and from there to there is 1,260 days. We see that this gap over here between the time the altar is shut down to the abomination is set up, it shows, according to Daniel's day counts, that is a 30-day period right there. And the woman, and the serpent, let's go to that, the Revelation 12, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away the flood, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So there's a flood right here too. In Jerusalem, uh, around springtime, there is a lot of rain, and it rushes down, uh, I believe, into the Dead Sea. 
I'm not going to get into that because I'm not really fully sure of exactly when this rain starts, but this it's, it's said, I've heard it said that this is a rainy time of the season for over there. Now, in Revelation 11, he says that uh, God says, I will give my power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand uh, two hundred and three score days. That's exactly the same of days right there. Clothed in sackcloth, and these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks to standing before the God of the earth. The same amount of period of time. It's 1260 days given there. So this is when, when that altar and that abomination is set up, that's when the two witnesses stand up and start their 1260 days of prophesying. They have the power to shut the heavens up from rain and, and, and cast as many plagues on uh, the earth as they will. Now we're back to the Lord's words here again. In Matthew 24, he said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun and the moon shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. In other words, it says immediately after tribulation. It says the Lord, it's, Let's go back and read that one more time. Immediately after tribulation, they'll see the Son of Man coming in heaven. Immediately after tribulation, and then shall appear the sign of man in heaven. And these are the days after tribulation. This says there's a 45-day period from the end of tribulation until the wedding feast. What we need to find out is that spot right there. We have one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have about eight or nine different uh, indicators of what this day will be like. We have abomination. We have desolate. We have fleeing. Uh, we have uh, tribulation beginning. We have winter is over. It's not on the Sabbath. There's a lot going on. There's a flood. Everything's going on right here at this hinge. We need to find that hinge. Let's look at something that's very, very interesting that's a likeness of what these things describe. I hope you can read this on your screen. This is pretty small to get it all on this one on this one uh, screen here, but I didn't I didn't have any other way to do it. it says a lamb was brought forth uh, into the house on this day and kept and killed on the very first Passover. This is uh, uh, and all the and then all the firstborn in the land of Egypt was killed who didn't have the lamb's blood on the on the doorpost. And then right after that, Israel departed into the wilderness on the Exodus. God parted the Red Sea. And Israel crossed over on dry ground. We're talking about the same language here. We're talking about a lamb. We're talking about a house. This is God's house. Uh, we're talking about Israel going into their new homes in the promised land. We're talking about a sacrifice. We have blood, the firstborn, fleeing, water, war, death. All of these things is the picture likeness, is a word picture of what you're seeing right here. Now, 40 years later, after Israel uh, crossed over the Red Sea and wandered around the wilderness, God dried up the Jordan River for Israel. This is under Joshua's leadership. Uh, and God's firstborn crossed over on dry ground to take possession of the promised land their homes. And there was Obviously, there was a lot of bloodshed and a lot of war so they could take over these possessions here. So we have the same language going on here again 40 years later. And we also have the same miracle happen. God dried up the Red Sea. They crossed over. He, he dried up the Jordan River. He crossed over. There's a flood going to happen here that, that God's going to help, and the earth's going to swallow it up too. So it's the same type of language. Also, we come to Yeshua, the first begotten son. He rode into Jerusalem, it says, the lamb presented for the inspection into God's house before he was crucified four days later. We even have Yeshua riding in. And he was the acceptable sacrifice. He was not an abomination. He was brought there for it. That's why he rode in. He was, he was the lamb inspected before the sacrifice was to happen. They didn't know what they were doing, but that's spiritually what it represented. And now we come to an unacceptable lamb or image of some kind we brought into God's house and presented for inspection and set up on the Temple Mount. This abomination starts, tribulation causes those in Judea to flee as God causes the, the flood waters to be swallowed up 
as it was the times before. Now, when they brought the lamb into the house before the first Passover, before Israel left Egypt, it was on Nisan the 10th, they were commanded to bring into the house. But now whenever Joshua led the children of Israel across the Jordan River, the Jordan River dried up. Only they, they crossed over dry shot over that river. That was also Nisan the 10th. When Yeshua rode into Jerusalem on that little uh, uh, colt of an ass, he rode into Jerusalem. That was also Nisan the 10th. Obviously, this unacceptable image is called a lamb with two horns. And lambs don't have horns. This is obviously an unacceptable sacrifice or unacceptable image sometimes is brought into God's house on Nisan the 10th also. So what we've got here, we've got all this information, all these clues, and it all points to Nisan the 10th. And uh, it also points to that it's in after winter time. It's in March the 21st. Now, it has to be Nisan the 10th or March the 21st or later after winter's over with. So let's bring down our markers again. Here's the altar. Here's the wedding feast, the one known blessed day that we know. And here's the abomination when the abomination is done. So according to the scriptures, all we have to do to find this spot is start at some wedding feast, some blessed day, and simply count back uh, 1,335 days to bring us to the altar. Or to find the image date, we count backwards 1,305 days brings us to the image date. Another way to find the image date is count uh, the full 1,335 back to the altar and then count forward 30 days. It's all going to bring us to this point right here. This is the this is the, the gateway. The This is the door, one of the doors that no man opened. Unless God opens it, no man can close it. Unless God closes it right here. We find this doorway right here, and we found when the Great Tribulation starts. Now, according to the information we've been given through Daniel, it's... It, in the other scriptures, it says this date is Nisan the 10th. It's not in the winter. If it's not in the winter, then it's on our March 21st or later. It's not on the Sabbath. It's before Passover. If it's March the 10th, that's obviously before Passover. This vision of Revelation 12 where the woman flees has to take place. It has to fit Daniel's timeline. It must be in 2013. In other words, it has to fit these day counts that, that's been given to us in Daniel. It also has to be in the year 2013, as according to the prophecies in Daniel and the and the uh, uh, fig tree nation that came about. And all this has to fit. So, if we remember back on our Hebrew calendars, now our focus is going to be on these last seven years. These matter of fact, these last three and a half years, the Hebrew calendar was based on lunar. The Hebrew years will have a 12 or 13 months. It varies. The Gregorian calendar is solar-based. It always has 365 unless it's a leap year. And these two different methods of calculation always makes these year these calendars inconsistent with each other. So what we have to do, well, this is an example first. Uh, the Feast of Tribulation, which is the wedding feast, this right here, always falls uh, on the Hebrew date 715 every year. But it falls on a different Gregorian date each year. It falls somewhere in September, October of the Gregorian calendar. So what we have to do is find this date that is compliant with uh, the Nisan the 10th and also uh, March the 21st are not in uh, winter time. So in order to do that, we just simply look at this three-and-a-half-year set right here. So we just look at different three-and-a-half-year sets using the wedding feast as our marker. We're just we're just plotting three-and-a-half-year sections here that we're going to analyze. Now, the, the, the wedding feast always happens on 715 on God's calendar or the Hebrew calendar right here. And you, just start, and you start right here and just count backwards 1,305 days. And see what where it brings us to. Will it be Nisan the tenth, not in the winter, not on the Sabbath? Let's see where it brings to see if it fits the prophecies. So we start out with 2004. Three and a half years later is 2007. We just look at our one given dates that we know, 
uh, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Wedding Feast in 2007 happens to be on September the 27th. You can go to any calendar program, any library, anywhere and get these same dates. September the 27th in 2007 happens to be the day that the Feast of Tabernacles begins to fall on. So just count back 1,305 days to see what this date is. This date happens to fall March the 2nd, 2004, and it's uh, the Hebrew date, Adar the 9th, which is the 12th month, the Hebrew's 12th month. So that doesn't match. It doesn't fit the prophecies. Let's try another set of three and a half years, 2005 to 2008. The wedding feast that year in 2008 happens to fall on October the 14th. Count back 305 days. We come to March the 20th. That could hit. It, it's That's pretty close. That's pretty close. Let's see what it is falls on the Hebrew calendar. If it falls on Nisan the 10th, we have a match. It falls on, this is one particular year they happen to have a 13-month year. It falls on 2nd, 8th, or the 9th. So that doesn't match. Let's go to the next set, 2009 to 2012. The Feast of Tabernacles that year is October the 1st. Back 1,305 days is to March the 7th, 8th or the 11th. That's no match. Now let's look at the 2013, the year that Daniel gave us, the year for the Daniel prophecies. 2013 to 2016. And Daniel's, according to Daniel's years, 2013 began uh, the, the Great Tribulation in the midst of the week right there. And according to Daniel's timeline, 2016 was the Lord's return, that little red marker right there. So let's see what the Feast of Tabernacles here. The Feast of Tabernacles is on October the 17th this year in 2016. Now, let's go to the March calendar. We're going to go to a March calendar in 2013. Here it is. March the 1st falls on a Friday. Uh, the end of winter is right there on Thursday, March the 21st. The next day is the winter ends here. Here's the Sabbath. You should have said your flight not being in the winter. Then you go on the Sabbath. So there's those two dates, or those two days. We're going to lay the Hebrew calendar in now on top of the March Roman calendar. Adar the 20th falls on March the 1st. We're just simply counting on forward. Here's Nisan the 1st falls on March the 12th. On right on through. That's amazing right there. Utterly amazing. Now, here's Passover and here's Unleavened Bread. And our tabernacles, here's our given date, is October the 17th. 2016 is October the 17th. Our t Feast of Tabernacles or the Wedding Feast are called a Blessed Day. Now, simply all we do now is count backwards 1,305 days from here to there to see what date it comes up. It can't fall here, can't fall here, can't fall here, can't fall here. Uh, it could fall here or here. It could fall, you know, it can't fall here. It's got to be before the Passover. It's got to match the Passover. I mean, it's got to, Israel fled here. They left Egypt here. It's got to be before that. I mean, there's not there's not much hope. I mean, there's not much uh, room there. There's plenty of hope, but there's not much room for this to hit. So from October the 17th, counting backwards 1,305 days to right here, and you can uh, go to the library or anywhere you that you want and count this and calculate this for yourself, it comes to exactly March the 22nd, 2013. Right there. The odds on that happening are astronomical. Astronomical. It falls, this is like going through the eye of a needle right here. So, we count backwards 30 days and that brings us to the altar somewhere around February the 20th. And then uh, to March the uh, 22nd, right here is the image. So what we've done, we qualified March the 21st. We call it, it's not on the Sabbath. Here's the Sabbath. is the day after. It's not in the winter. Winter was over over here. It's not. It's Nissan the 10th. We've hit it exactly. If the fling starts at the evening closing of this day right here, we're on Nissan the 10th. 
Uh, it's before the Passover. Daniel's timeline, it fits uh, the day count and also fits 2013. All those things. Now, counting on forward from here, the, the uh, 1,260 days that the woman is fed in the wilderness and the two witnesses start their prophesying would begin here. 260 days later brings us to September the 2nd of 2016. There's our 40 to 5 day period right in here, the days after tribulation. Uh, look what falls in between here. These are the days immediately following tribulation. These just happen to be the unfulfilled feast of the Lord, which Yeshua has not fulfilled at a hundredfold measure as yet. First, we have the Feast of Trumpets falls in there at October the 3rd. It falls right there. The Day of Atonement falls right here. I guess we've all heard of, we've all heard of the last trump, and we've all heard of the Day of Atonement. And the Feast of Tabernacles, which you've already covered, that is the wedding feast. Now, the last trump or the Day of the Lord, the judgment or the and this 120th Jubilee year, and the wedding feast right here. Now, what about this vision of Revelation 12? Here is the sign, or here's, here is the scripture to, that shows the sign. Revelation 12 says, and, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child, uh, cried, travaileth, travaileth in birth, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and the seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be, deli ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was made to rule the nations with an iron of rod, Notice he's got some kind of a rod with him. And her child was caught up into God and to his throne. Now in Mark, the Lord, the Lord himself says, uh, and if a kingdom shall be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Now that's an interesting comment right there. Now let's turn to exactly what Daniel sees and what he's describing here. This is called the elliptic. This is what the heavenly bodies move across. The, all the Maseroth signs. This is like Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, uh, Leo is up here. This is the this is what they move across. Here's Virgo. It says the moon will be under her feet, like this. It said to have a crown of twelve stars. Coma Bernice is well known to be a. Uh, it's, there's twelve stars in this. It's well known to be a crown for her. Saturn, now I know there's Saturn worship, there's evil Saturn worship, but whatever God created Saturn for absolutely precedes and dominates whatever man has, in his wickedness has created. So Saturn represents the man-child, or it represents Israel. And, uh, and like I say, I know that there's uh, Saturn worship, and this I just can't stress enough that whatever God created things for, proceeds and overrides anything else man has dreamed up and here's the serpent it's called serpent's kaput this serpent this uh, constellation is very very unique it is the only constellation in the whole heavens that is divided among itself but is still counted as one constellation here is serpent's caudia over here that's the serpent's tail and that means serpent's head it's the only one in the whole heavens that's divided among itself. It's, but it still counts as one constellation. This sign appears over Jerusalem, March the 2nd, 2013, at 5.58 a.m. That sign appears. Here's the actual, here's the dragon. Here's Arcturus. This is the Arcturus uh, that uh, Job spoke about. It's in the Booty's constellation. Notice that he carries, a, he's got him an iron rod there and a sickle for harvest. This constellation, he's also called uh, the herdsman or the shepherd who keeps all the rest of the celestial beast in line. Here's the actual star plat that came off of that. Uh, here's the Virgo. Here's the, the uh, serpent. 
There's a beast here that's holding the head and the tail back. And then here is uh, here's the Booty's constellation, which the star Arcturus is in. So we have fulfilled vision of Revelation 12 also. And it falls in March the 2nd right here, right before they start to flee. So what we have so far, we have Daniel's timeline. We have the year is confirmed. And it's a consistent, perfect match with the midst of the week where it shows the February of the altar will be shut down in 2013. The revelation, the vision of Revelation 12 appears in 2013 in the image. Also, the actual three-and-a-half-year day count calculation 2013. We have a perfect match here. Now we're moving on to the day and the hour. The day and the hour supposedly that no man knoweth. Now, all three of these are going to have to be consistent. This matches with this, and this matches with that, but now this has to tie in to all of them. If it doesn't tie in, then none of this is right. None of it's right. It's got to tie in. The day and the hour. Who mainly uses the following quote? No man knoweth the day or the hour of the Lord's return. No, not even the angels in heaven. Well, is that even an accurate quote? Let's go to the Scriptures of Truth and see what it really says. First of all, it says, No man knoweth the day or the hour. Well, let's see what the Scriptures really say. In Luke, according to Luke 12, this is the Lord's words himself. He says, Ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that you do not, do not discern this time? The Lord, as the Lord, as the Lord said this Himself, He's very plain. He said, "Why in the world can't you figure this out?" Now think about it. Now, if all the clues to our Lord's return were never be meant to be understood, why did Yeshua and the prophets go to such length to give them? There's a multitude of them. If we're not supposed to understand them, wouldn't that be considered considered idle words? I mean, if all this much speaking is done about His return, and we don't know when it is. Wouldn't that be considered, considered idle words? And there's no idle words in the Scriptures. What about Revelation? He said, And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must be shortly be done. And that's obviously that to Revelations. That's to those that group, that generation on whom the ends of the earth will fall, which is us. Deuteronomy the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Here's, here's Yeshua speaking in John. He says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. And here's another one in John. And how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. Now, Paul, even in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he says, uh, "But of the time of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write them to you." That means he can. If there's no need that he can write, that means he can. For ye, uh, for yourselves, know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, right down here, he says, "But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief." He says, they're not in darkness. They know when it is. Ye are children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And he even says that they know and that he could write to them about it, but they have no need because they already know themselves. Now, let's go to the verses that they use for no man knoweth the day or the hour. This is We're going to dissect this. Matthew 24, and then these are all the Lord's words here. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. The Lord says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun and the moon shall be, uh, the sun and the moon shall not give her light, and the, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall, uh, powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and these, and then sign, and then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with heaven and with power and with great glory and he shall send his angel with the great with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from four winds from one end of the heaven to the other that is obviously his return 
There's no question about that. That's the return of the Lord right there. We're going to call that time frame number one. These verses, 29 through 31, this is his return. It says it's after tribulation. He says an angel sounds a trumpet, and there's also, no, we know that there's a feast of trumpets. Let's go to the next set of verses, the same chapter, 32 through 34. Yeshua saying, now learn the far a parable of the fig tree. He's changing subject. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put, put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, though it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. He's, ta he's, got, he's talking about the fig tree parable here, which we know what date that is. We've got time frame number two. He's talking about, he's not talking about his return. He's talking about a starting point. We have time frame number two, the parable of the fig tree, and that generations will not pass. And that we know that date. That We know that date exactly. That's November the 29th, 1947. Now, here he says that generation shall not pass. That generation shall not pass until all these things fulfill. fulfilled. Let's go to the next set. 35 through 36, he said, but heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not. But of that day knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. He just got through saying that heaven and earth will pass away, but of that day, that particular day and hour that heaven and earth pass away, knoweth no man, no, not the angels. Now, if an angel is going to blow the trumpet up here on the Feast of Trumpets, obviously angel knows when he's going to blow it. Angel sounds a trumpet up here. But this is a different day. The heaven and earth shall pass away, but of that day. What he's saying here says heaven and earth will pass, but he won't he won't pass away. His words will not. Which is greater? The creator or the created? It's the creator. Heaven and earth will pass, but not him. So we have time frame number three here. When heaven and earth passing away. Time frame number three. Heaven and earth will pass away after the sometime after the thousand year reign. That day and hour is unknown. But now if the angel is going to sound the trumpet up here, the angel obviously knows when to sound the trumpet. So this they try to drag this verse, his return, down into this verse here, confusing the two. Saying that no man knoweth the day or the hour of the Lord's return. No, not even the angels. It didn't say that. It said the heaven and earth will pass away, but that day knoweth no man. Now let's now we're going to the next verse. He says, But as the days of Noah, so shall be the coming son of man be. He's just changed subject again. He's changed it back to his return again. Time frame he's back to time frame number one. His return is in the days of Noah. Now let's look at this whole thing, days of Noah. Uh this is thirty four, I mean thirty seven through forty two. But as the days of Noah were, so shall be the coming son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood took them all away. Now who is taken here? Was that Noah taken? Or was that the people that were eating and drinking, giving in marriage? It, the scriptures, according to the scriptures, the ones that was taken here, is the ones they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. It says, So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, uh, the one shall be taken and the other left. That's the same thing. Who is taken and who is left? Not Noah. He wasn't taken. He, his, he and his family knew a hundred years before the flood. Took them a hundred years to build an ark. They weren't taken; they were left. Let's look at the parable. Let's look at the parable of the harvest. Yeshua was very plain about this. He spoke of the parable of the harvest about the owner of the field planting seed, planting good seed. His servants came to him and said, uh, "Master, somebody has planted bad seed overnight," and uh, the master said, "It was the enemy." He said, well, shall we pull up the the, uh, the bad seed? And he said, no, lest you harm the good seed also. Let them both grow up together. 
And when they're both grown at the time of harvest, we'll pull out the evil seed, the bad seed, which is the uh, tares and the chaff, and we'll throw those into the fire. That's the first thing that's taken is the bad. And then he says, and then we'll gather my wheat into the barn. That's the exact correlation of what's being said right here, the same order. So it isn't the it isn't the the good that's taken; it's the evil that's taken. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs ten thirty, it says, "The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inherit the earth." It says, "The righteous shall never be removed." Noah wasn't removed; he was the only one left. And who all was with him on the ark? Everybody else was removed. Here's the famous line that they use. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord Lord doeth come. Now, Yeshua is not talking about heaven and earth here. He's talking about the hour that, the, that your Lord comes. Not heaven and earth this time. He's talking about your Lord. And they use this. This is what's used to say no man knoweth the day or the hour. Well, instead, this rather than being a negative thing, this is a huge positive clue telling us when his return. If you will recall back on the uh, on the moon phases, it says, Watch, therefore, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Remember these moon phases when the two witnesses would be on the Temple Mount and no man, no man knew the day or the hour that they would see the uh, new moon? They would be up there for as much as 48 hours looking for this sliver. No man knew the day or the hour. Well, it just so happens there is one of the Lord's feasts falls on a new moon. And coincidentally enough, that that feast is called the Feast of Trumpets or the Last Trump, when the dead in Christ shall rise first. That is the first fall feast. Now, let's go right into something else here that's pretty astonishing. And uh, this Feast of Trumpets we're looking at, which falls in the days immediately after tribulation, this is what he says again. We covered this a while ago, but I want to bring up this this is a very interesting point here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Now, what what could that be? It could be smoke from bombs or wars or, or who knows what. But there is one thing that does happen that uh, we do know of. There is a solar eclipse on September the 1st right there. There is a lunar eclipse that follows that on September the 16th, right there. And after that, there is another solar eclipse that hits on October the 2nd, the day before tribulation, or the day before the Feast of Trumpets. We have three eclipses that happen within just a few days of each other. Solar feast, the solar uh, the the Gentiles, what they call the Gentiles, our Gregorian calendar goes by solar. That uh, solar feast is supposed to represent something ha happening to the Gentiles. Lunar, God's months and calendar goes by the lunar. This is, is supposed to be something happening to Israel. And again, we got to have another solar eclipse that happens to something to, the, to mankind or the Gentiles. Very interesting. I don't know if this... Uh, eclipses are what's referred to here, but I'm sure it's no coincidence that these things occur. They're signs. Now let's go on to our, in our fixed calendar, our solar-based calendar. The Feast of Trumpets is, cannot fall on Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday, but it can fall on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Now this is according to the way our fixed calendar lays out. Now, if we're the tabernacle of the living God, doesn't it seem normal that the things of our Father will be revealed in us if we just ask Him? I mean, He wants to dwell in us. Now, let's just plot these out. Sunday, no, it can't. No, the, the, the Feast of Trumpets cannot fall on Sunday. It cannot fall on a Wednesday. It cannot fall on a Friday. And back to Sunday again. But it can fall on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Now, if there's supposed to be a 48-hour period that the Feast of Trumpets is going to hit on, what 48-hour period do you see? I only see one there. It's Monday to Tuesday. Now, let's go to the October 2016 calendar when this Feast of Trumpets is going to occur. Here's the dates. And we already determined back on a little earlier chart there that, uh, that 
October the 3rd, 2016, was the, when the Feast of Trumpets falls in the year of that year, which also matches exactly uh, what the how it works out, the 48-hour the period. And that's no coincidence either. This if this makes it just pretty plain right here. We're, all we're doing is counting the months, days of the month right here down to the 22nd. I only stopped at the 22nd because I've ran out of room here, but there's enough room to get the point across and get the message what I believe God wants to reveal here. In the beginning of the months, when the if the first of the month, the beginning of the month, when the, when the calendar was given to Moses, was on Nisan the one on the first day of Nisan right here. Now then, on the tenth day of the month, the lamb was inspected and brought in before the very first Passover. The Passover occurred on the fourteenth. The unleavened bread was for three days, and then the first fruits was on the first day of the week, and it finished out the first fruits. Now the Lord has has fulfilled all these. He was the lamb inspected. He rode into Jerusalem. Uh, the Passover, his death, burial, unleavened bread, first fruits, his resurrection. He's fulfilled these. Now look at what's left on the seventh month, on the on the fall feast in the seventh month. That's quite astonishing how it lays out. Here's Shavuot. This is the day that uh, the Holy Ghost was given. This is also called Pentecost in the, in the Christian churches. It happened sometime later, down a few months, a couple of months later. But now we're into the seventh month up here. On the first of the seventh month, we have the Feast of Trumpets. On the tenth, we have the Day of Atonement right here. And then the Feast of Tabernacles falls on the 15th through the 21st. And then there is a Holy Convocation on the eighth day. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. I mean, this looks like a mirror image of each other. And if he fulfilled these first feasts when he was here the first time, it doesn't take much to figure out what he's going to fulfill on his return. Trumpets, the last trump, Day of Atonement was also judgment, and Tabernacles is the wedding feast. That's, that's pretty plain. Now, just as a curious example, I put... I don't know what was on the back side of the Ten Commandments, but it, this is just as good a guess as any. As it does say they were written on both sides. One side could be the you know, all these commandments, statutes, and laws, and the other side could be his feast because he definitely declared his feast. And and your Lord, my Lord, our Lord, fulfill these. These are yet to be fulfilled. Now, Daniel's timeline, 2013, fit the midst of the week, fit the day and the hour, that no man knoweth happens to be the Feast of Trumpets 2016 after the tribulation. We have a consistent, perfect match on all of this. All of this complements each other. None of it is contradictory. All the prophecy fell into place all on its own. There was nothing forced in anywhere. It's just like God plans it. If God plans it, if it's God's truth, everything falls into place. All we have to do is just stay out of the way and watch it happen. Now, the confirming witnesses we have, we have Daniel's timeline, the 70 years Shavuot, or 70 years. We have the evidence of the Jubilee years calculations, counting both backwards and forwards. We went back 200 years. We even back, went back to the year 333 B.C., all the way back to the second beast, which was Alexander the Great. We had the parable of the fig tree nation, which is 1947. The 47th commandment uh, of Israel going forth as a nation again. That's astonishing. That's the only country in the whole world that, that became a nation again and and had their same capital as they had. Never happened before in history ever. We have the ancient times revealing the future, the precise counting of the three, of days in three and a half years, using the Hebrew set, uh, the Hebrew calendar. That overlaying on our Gregorian calendar is astonishing that those things matched up like that. It's truly like a camel going through the eye of a needle. We have the the tenth of Nisan events, including the water miracles, uh, when the children brought in the lamb, the abomination, the abominable lamb they brought in, the lamb of two horns, the uh, dried up the Red Sea was not on the tenth, but it was it was a correlation of these events that began with this. We have uh, Jordan River drying up on the tenth month of Nisan. 
Yeshua rode in the tenth of Nisan, the lamb presented for inspection. We have the meaning of the Lord's feast, which you've covered pretty clearly, that the last feast, the last three feasts, the fall feast, have not been fulfilled yet in a hundredfold measure. We have the vision of Revelation 12 that happens in 2013. And we just have asking, believing God to reveal the truth, which he will. It's just knock and you shall receive. And then the confirmation of the 120th Jubilee year. We've had all these witnesses, all these witnesses, and all of these have complied with one another. Uh, let's look at all 70 Shavuot. Or look, we're going to look at all 70 years right now. Here's our prophetic baseline right here. Here's We're going to lay out the all 70 years from the commandment. Now, this is where a lot of folks miss it. It says the commandment went forth. So the commandment went forth in 1947. So the first Shavuot or the first Feast of Weeks that would have, would have shown up would have been in 1948. We'll put 48 through here through the next for the 10 years. This thing in blue is one of the sabbatical years. If you'll remember back, we showed how to count sabbatical years. There's 10, there's 20 years. There's our first Jubilee year we found. It's 30 years, 40, 50, 60. There's all 70 Feast of Weeks for all 70 Shavuot. Here's our 119th Jubilee year. And here's the one that has been shown to be our 120th Jubilee years in 2017. Now, if we'll count these years, all of it, beginning at uh, 47, if you wanted to count them, we could. There's 10, there's 20, there's 30, 40, 50, 60, 61, 62. Right there at the end of that is 62 years, just like it shows up here. 2010, 2010 begins the seven-year period right here. And coincidentally, this uh, 70, this seven-week period right here happens to be a complete full sabbatical year set year one two three four five six in the seventh year of the sabbatical year and remember that's the 49th year and then the next year is the 50th year of the jubilee and this like i said before this uh seven year period prophetic week just also happens to be a full sabbatical year set before the jubilee now in the and he says he will confirm the covenant for the many in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease right there right there in the midst 2013 and here's where we are right now as at the time this was being recorded we're at 2005 even though uh i have given this uh, to a few people way back in 2000 i just haven't felt like that it was time yet to bring it out so it's, it's time to be brought out and it's, we're not far away from from the uh, end of 62 years, as you can see. This date right here, this date right here is exactly where we're at. We're in the third year, one, two, three, past the fifth sabbatical of the 119th Jubilee year. In other words, the 119th Jubilee was here. We're in the one, two, three, four, five. Five sabbaticals have passed, and we're into the one, two, third year. So January of 2005 equals uh, the third year past the fifth sabbatical of the 119th Jubilee year. Now here's the whole here's the whole overlay the whole overlay of everything. Uh, November 1947, the 70 years began. It goes all the way to here to the 70th. Shavuot in 2017, when the millennium rest is in the in play. From 47, we have the 62 years, which begins the prophetic week. This is the prophetic week right here, the seven-year prophetic week. Here's the midst of the prophet, prophetic week. When the altar s shuts down, the 1260 days that the woman fled uh, starts. We have the seals, trumpets, and plagues, all that happening. We have the end of tribulation in the 45 days which is the, uh, the days of tribulation immediately following, uh, the days immediately following tribulation, which by no coincidence happens to have the Feast of Trumpets, the last trump fall in there, the Day of Atonement, Judgment, and the 120th Jubilee is sounded right here, and then the wedding feast right here on this Feast of Tabernacles. It's astonishing how God puts everything together. 
Now, trying to force all the prophecy pieces into place always leaves loose ends that never really fit. When God reveals the truth, all the pieces just fall into place all on their own. In Revelation 3.3, 3, the Lord said, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. He just said, If you watch, I will not come as a thief. If you watch, I will not come as a thief. Thanks for watching. January the 5th, this is where we are. We're in the third year past the fifth sabbatical of the 119th Jubilee year. Thank you for watching and thank you for your time.